If you can remember before exam two, the last thing we did was lecture 18, which is actually part of this unit. And that was a lab, something kind of experimental, uh, kind of intuitive, where I had these containers with either different categories of colors, white and black, or different numbers. And we sampled from them over and over, calculated sample proportions or sample means, and looked at the frequency of how many different, uh, how many different times we got each value. And we noticed sort of a bell shape to those, right? Both for proportions and for means. So we're going to, in lectures 19 and 20, put a little bit more math and some formulas behind that. But let me start by doing kind of a speed run of what lab 18 looked like, especially for proportions. So here I've got an applet. I can decide what I want a population proportion to be. Uh, let's make it 0.3. Then I can pick a sample size and it will generate one sample of 100 observations out of this population. And it will calculate the proportion in the sample that are in the category of interest. So we would expect to get 0.3 as the most likely value, but every sample is random. And it looks like for this sample, we didn't have 30% following the category of interest, but 21%. So we get a single observation of a sample proportion, 0.21. But I take another sample. All right, this one ends up being closer to 0.3. This sample had a proportion of 0.27. And then there's another one. I happen to have three that are all below the true proportion, but eventually it seemed like it uh, couldn't be too long before we got one on the upper side. And there's another and another. And you can see that most of the time it's pretty close to 0.3. And then every now and then it's a little bit farther away. If we click this next button, it'll make a histogram out of all of those sample proportions that it's seen. And where does it look like? Looks like a normal, yeah. I can click this show normal curve, puts it on top of it, and we can see it's a pretty good fit. The one other thing that we learned from the lab is that as we change the sample size, that changes the amount of uh, spread, the standard deviation of all these different sample proportions. Let's consider 100 to be kind of a small sample size. And we see these are going from about 0.13 to 0.47, a good bit of spread. If we instead took very large samples of size 1000. These aren't nearly as spread out anymore, right? There's a higher probability of being close to that true proportion of 0.3. And so they scaled the number line and now everything's more tightly uh, clustered around 0.3. All right, so there's a speed run of the qualitative part of lab 18. Let's go into the notes here now. Uh, we begin with a formal statement of this result, which is called the central limit theorem. And I've made it, so I'm going to give you two versions of this, one for qualitative data here and then a quantitative version in lecture 20. Suppose there's a qualitative variable, something categorical, for which P is the proportion of the population that falls into whatever category you're interested in. And we plan to calculate the sample proportion, P hat, from a random sample of N independent observations. Then as long as n times p is greater than 10, and n times 1 minus p is greater than 10, then the sample proportion, p hat, is approximately normal. As long as you meet those two inequalities, n times p and n times 1 minus p, both being greater than 10, and p hat is close enough to a normal, we're going to say it's practically normal or approximately normal. Every normal has a mean and standard deviation, right? So what should we use as the mean and standard deviation for this normal that approximates p hat? Well, the mean of the sample proportion is it's whatever the true proportion is. I think that's pretty obvious. We see that in the simulation, right? Yeah, the sample proportion is random, but where is it centered? wherever that true proportion P is. So the mean of P hat is equal to P. The standard deviation of P hat is a little more complicated and we will do a little bit of work to see where this comes from. But it's P times one minus P over N all under a square root. All right, 
these two formulas, you're going to see these pop up over and over again from now till the end of the semester. So I don't usually recommend memorizing things, but you may as well because you're going to see it so much. Uh, just a note on alternate notation you might see. I like to use sigma with a p hat in the subscript to denote this is the standard deviation of the sample proportion. Uh, sometimes this is also called the standard error. And so if you're following the textbook, they write it like this, SE for standard error uh, with p hat. They mean the same thing. In the notes, I'll be using the uh, sigma notation for this. All right, so the next thing I want to know is uh, how does this work? In particular, where, where are these formulas coming from? We were able to see the first one intuitively, but is there a mathematical uh, reason for this being true? And definitely, where is that second one coming from? Another question, why do we have to meet these two conditions up here to say p hat is approximately normal? Well, for that, I'm gonna to go to an applet that I think we've already seen earlier in the class. Okay, here, normal approximation to uh, binomial. Let's think about binomials for a minute. We saw that as long as n is large and p is not too extreme, that looks a lot like a normal, right? And I can click this thing to show the normal curve and they match up very, very well. But there's two situations where they don't, uh, they don't match up very well. One is, what if n is really small? If n gets pretty small, yeah, these bars get more, uh, more chunky. They don't fit that smooth normal curve as well. So if n is really small, the binomial doesn't look that normal. And the other case is if p is extreme, if p is really close to zero, or if p is really close to one, then the bars don't match up very well with that continuous normal curve. It's even worse than it actually appears here because the normal keeps on going. This graphic doesn't show it, but yeah, normals keep going on the whole number line. It's possible for the normal to be larger than 17, but binomial can't be. So there's a real mismatch between the area under the curve and the heights of the bars. So how do we make sure that N is large enough and also that P is somewhere in the middle? And how do you balance those out? That's where these conditions come from. Keeps the binomial from being too chunky or too squished up against the boundaries. So that means that binomials are really close to normal. We had a couple of formulas for the mean and standard deviation of a binomial. Uh, let's see, were these in 14, maybe? 15, this might have been lecture 15. And deriving both of these, especially the second one, I think that's a bit too much for a uh, intro level stat course. You can take it like a, a 3000 level probability that we teach. If you simply have to know, we'll just take it on faith in here. So if this is the mean and standard deviation of a binomial, well, binomials represent frequencies or counts in a category, the number of successes in your sample of independent uh, identical binary trials. Well, there's a relationship between sample proportions and frequencies. Isn't the sample proportion just the frequency in that category divided by the sample size? Huh? Yeah. And so symbolically, if X is the random number that models the frequency and N is represented by the sample size, well, a sample proportion is just a binomial random variable divided by n. So shouldn't I be able to take the formulas for the mean and standard deviation of a binomial and divide those by n? That works, and we're gonna do that on the next page. So if I want to know what the mean for a sample proportion is, I should take the mean for the frequency modeled by a binomial and divide it by the sample size. The mean of a binomial is n times p, and when you divide that by n, the n's cancel, and you just get p, the true population proportion, 
which is what we wrote down as one of the formulas under the central limit theorem. And also it's what we observed in that lab. That makes sense. And there's a mathematical reason for it. For the standard deviation, uh, slightly more in detail algebra, take the standard deviation of the binomial, divide that by n. So I'm taking the square root of n times p times one minus p and dividing that by n. Uh, and I'd like to be able to cancel the ends, but if one's under a square root and the other one is not, I can't cancel them out directly. Uh, but isn't n the same thing as the square root of n squared? Yeah, it is. So I can make the denominator n squared and then everything is under a square root. Now I can cancel the n in the top of the fraction with one of the copies in the bottom. And there's the formula for the standard deviation of the sample proportion. So that's a little bit abstract. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you any homework or exam questions where you have to redrive these, th these things. Just wanted you to see that, you know, there's, there's a place this comes from. Any questions on that? All right, so let's move into the more practical things. Uh, here are some kinds of questions that I would ask you to do in quizzes, homeworks, and exams. This means if we have any probability questions about sample proportions, we can solve these just like we did the probability questions for normals. We just have to use these new formulas for the mean and standard deviation of a sample proportion. So I break it down into a three-step process. Uh, step one, check that you meet the conditions for the approximation. We need n times p to be bigger than 10, and n times 1 minus p greater than 10. If you pass both of those, that's a good thing mathematically, and you keep going. It's a bad thing for you because it means you get more work to do. If you fail either one of those, that's bad mathematically, but that's good for you as somebody who's uh, probably a lazy student, and even me, a lazy instructor. It means you don't finish the problem. It's not a good situation for approximating with a normal, and you state that, and you don't go any farther. All right. So you have to meet that check before you keep going. Then calculate the mean of standard deviation, the normal that you use to approximate the sample proportion. And it's those two formulas, we've written them several times. So I don't think it's a bad idea to you know, get these ingrained in your head. And then at this point, maybe we're starting to understand why we spent so much time learning how to work with normals. For one, sample proportions uh, are normal. It will then become identical to the kind of problems that you had in lecture 16 and 17. In particular, the ones from 17, because most of the time this is not going to be uh, a standard normal. In fact, for this con situation, it never will be. All right, let's, uh, let's use this to solve a problem. So last semester, I had uh, several sections of STAT 14 one, 120 students. I can think of this as the sample size, sample of 120 students. On any given day, about 85% of them would show up to class. Now, I, I wrote these notes before the pandemic. This is not true at all in the last few semesters. But let's say uh, the, the showing up to class, the success category, and the not showing up to class is the fail category. Maybe literally. So uh, the population proportion in the success category is 0.85. Use the normal approximation for proportions to find the probability that uh, less than 90% show up to class. So I read through it and I, I recognize that, well, the proportion that show up to class, it's a sample proportion that's random. And I can treat that as a normal as long as I meet the conditions. So I'm gonna follow these three steps right here. Step one is n times p greater than 10 and is n times one minus p greater than 10. Well, uh, n is 120, p is 0.85. Uh, you multiply those, you get 102. 
Uh, yeah, that's bigger than 10. So I met the first one. Uh, N is 120. 1 minus P, 1 minus 0.85, uh, would be 0.15. So 15% of 120. That is 18. That's also bigger than 10. A little bit close, but uh, it meets the condition. Okay, so it's kind of bad news because I got to do the rest of the problem. So if I'm going to approximate the proportion that show up to class with a normal, what should I use as the mean and standard deviation? Well, for the mean, I'm going to use whatever the true proportion is, which is given to me in the problem is 0.85. So no calculations required for that formula, just see what P is. Standard deviation of P hat. This is the more complex of the two formulas. 0.85 times 0.15 over 120. For the sake of time, before class, I calculated that out to five significant digits, 0 0.032596. Okay, and the last step. I never actually wrote out the probability that I have to find to finish. My probability is about a sample proportion. And I want the probability that's less than 90%. I'm going to convert it into a decimal, a proportion, so that I can put it in the spreadsheet in a moment. I need that less than 0.9. And then what's the smallest the proportion can be? Yeah, I'll put in zero here. But I approximate it with a normal. Can't normals go below zero? They can. So should I put zero or should I put like negative nine 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 nine? Zero. Okay. So for most people, it seems like zero makes more sense. As long as you meet the the check in step one, it won't matter because the probability under the curve, area under the curve to the left of zero is gonna be negligible. So part of the reason we do this check is making sure we don't have weird things like that, like negative proportions or uh, negative people showing up to class. So I think zero makes more sense if you do negative 99999. Let's test that in the spreadsheet in a minute. I think we'll get answers that are practically identical. So I've identified a lower bound and an upper bound. And then in step two, I've got the mean of center deviation that I need. It's exactly like the old normal problems. So I'll go to lecture demonstration spreadsheets. Uh, normals are here. It is a non-standard normal. So I come down here to the lower left. Let me try it first with the lower bound of zero, upper bound of 0.9. For the mean, use the 0.85 found in step two. And for the standard deviation, uh, I can type in that 0 0.032596, but a lot of times when I'm doing these, I'll actually type in that formula that I used to calculate it, and I don't have to worry about any rounding error at all. So I can use SQRT for the square root function, and then P, one minus P over N. And I can see, okay, yeah, there's where the 0 0.032596 came from. So my probability looks like 0.93748. And there's my final answer. About a 94% chance that uh, less than 90% of the class will show up on any given day. Uh, the formula that I plugged in last, it was this one. I, did, I put this one in the spreadsheet. In the standard deviation cell. And I'll put my cursor over it again so you can see it in the formula bar up there. Okay, uh, so what would happen if I had used a 
very large negative number for the lower bound. Nine, 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 nine. Probability didn't change at all. So we don't have to worry about uh, a detail like that. All right, any questions on that example? Second part of the example, what's the attendance rate such that more people show up with probability 0.6? This time it's giving me a probability and I'm looking for an attendance rate. Sounds inverted, sounds like an inverse problem. So before I go any further, I'm gonna sketch over on the side. These sample proportions can be modeled with a normal that is centered at 0.85. And then we're looking for an attendance rate. We don't know what it is. Uh, as always, I'm using C to represent that. But what I do know, the probability that more people show up is 0.6. The area under the curve to the right is 0.6. I don't want to shade that one. I need to shade the area to the left. So 1 minus 0.6, 0 0.4. Yeah, that's the area to the left. Technically, I should go through the same three steps, but I've already done one and two. Those aren't going to change. I still have the same value of N and P. So I'm going to use the same values for uh, mu and P that I've already found. All right, but then step three. I need the area to the left, which is 0.4. So go to the spreadsheet. Come over here for the inverse on standard normals. Put in that area under the curve to the left. Put in the mean and the standard deviation. And this time, instead of the formula, I'll just type it. Looks like 0.84174. Let's do a common sense check. Does that seem reasonable? I think so. For this one, I'll end with a, a sense of interpretation. Uh, the attendance rate is more than For the interpretation sentence, I'll, I'll put it as a percentage. It seems a little more natural and not carry quite so many significant figures. Is more than 84.2% on 60% of class days. The attendance rate is more than 84.2% on 60% of class days. And maybe you wonder, does anybody actually do problems like this? Or is it something we use to torture uh, statistics students? Well, before the pandemic, uh, I didn't have all of my quizzes online in Folio. I had them on paper and I'd actually print them and pass them out to people to turn them in uh, and for me to grade more manually. Um, and I realized pretty quickly, if I've got 30 people enrolled in the class and I print 30 quizzes every day, I'm gonna have a lot of leftover paper because people don't come. But I can do a calculation like this and I can say, I can handle a 5% chance that I don't have enough quizzes. So I find the attendance rate such that it's larger than that only 5% of the time. I get that number of quizzes, I just print out those. And then I'm not wasting quite so much paper and the chance that I'm actually shorthanded is still pretty small. So uh, there are actually applications of this that are uh, practical. Questions on that? Okay, uh, we're ahead of time, that's good. Just uh, looking ahead a little bit, after this module, we're gonna get back into statistics, we're gonna be doing inferential statistics. And here's a couple of ways that we're going to use the material out of this uh, lecture 19 and what's coming. 
the normal that we use to approximate a sample proportion, it's not going to be a standard normal. So yeah, looking over here, the mean is not zero, the standard deviation is not one, but we can use the z-score formula to convert things into a standard normal, right? Sure. So in the context of sample proportions, I can get back a standard normally distributed random variable z by taking a sample proportion Throw it into the z-score formula, subtract its mean, divide by its standard deviation. Well, the mean for sample proportion is just the true population proportion, place that with p. Then sigma p hat, that's the messier one under the square root. So if I know P and N, I can use this formula. I can convert a sample proportion to something that's standard normal. It's not always realistic. In, in real life, I'm not going to know the population proportion. That's something that I, the whole reason I'm doing this study and doing statistics is to try to estimate it. So what we're gonna do is uh, one of two things. When we do hypothesis testing, we're gonna hypothesize a value of P. We're going to pick a value and say, can I believe that this is the true population proportion? Whatever that hypothesized value is, we'll call that P naught. So we're going to have a formula that we'll use quite a bit where all the occurrences of P are replaced by a hypothesized or a guess that value of P naught. So this formula is used in hypothesis testing. Another thing that we might do we'll leave the p that we don't know in the numerator there, but then everywhere the p shows up in the denominator, we'll replace it with the sample proportion because hopefully the sample proportion is a good stable estimate of that. So then there's only one occurrence of the unknown p. And then we could do some algebra and we could solve for this. And that's used in confidence intervals, which we're pretty close to. We're gonna do that in lecture 21, I think. So your quizzes and homework for 19, you're not actually gonna to have to do any of this stuff that's under the, the looking ahead section. This is just, just a preview, trying to get your mind ready for what's coming soon. Questions on that or anything else in 19? All right, uh, I've tried the quiz questions, just five of them. That lecture ended up being pretty short, should be plenty of time to try these, check them against the key. Uh, and then in maybe 10, 15 minutes, we'll go into lecture 20.